un chaleureux bienvenue aux personnes qui nous rejoignent ici et d'ailleurs. I'm also grateful to have my colleagues and philanthropic partners from other countries joining us, as well as members of the International Board. Thank you to the Weizmann Institute management and staff who are leading us through these challenging times and moving the research forward. Never before has the critical role of basic science been more apparent. Science will have the answer. And the Weizmann Institute, with its multidisciplinary, curiosity-driven approach, is uniquely positioned to make a significant impact in solving this crisis. The recent ranking of number two in the world by nature brought us great pride and comes with great responsibility, which our scientists have always taken very seriously. As you'll hear in a moment from Ziv, at least 50 groups of scientists have pivoted their research to focus on various aspects of this crisis, from more efficient testing, to predicting outbreaks, to developing vaccines and finding a cure, even science education activities for kids of all ages who are at home. Amid the fear of the cure being worse than the disease, professors Ron Milo and Uri Alon are here today to share with us their mathematical-based model to reopen society more quickly and restart the economy. Thank you, Ron and Uri, for making the time to speak with us today. We are so grateful for the glimmer of hope you're providing. At this time, I would like to introduce Professor Ziv Reich and ask him to say a few words on behalf of the Weizmann Institute Management and to introduce our guest speaker, our guest speakers. Feel free at any time during the presentation to text questions to our scientists using the chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you prefer, you can send them to me at susan at weitzman.ca and I'll put that in the chat box. Professor Reich is vice president of the Weizmann Institute, as well as being a leader in the field of biochemistry. And we are honored to have him here with us today. Ziv. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm replacing Roy this, uh, this evening as he's attending a, a scientific meeting right now through Zoom. So uh, I'd like to start by thanking all of you for attending this meeting and uh, for your continued support during these challenging times we're having. Uh, as you probably know, um, we work under fairly strict restrictions. Uh, about uh, only uh, one third uh, of the personnel is allowed to be on campus. Uh, nonetheless, we make every effort uh, to make sure that our scientific activities uh, remain roughly uninterrupted. Um, these are difficult times and during difficult times, you change your routine. And so we did at the Wiseman. And the result is that right now we have 60 groups that actually put aside whatever they were doing before and devote themselves during the last two months um, uh, to, to corona research, uh, different aspects could be therapeutics, diagnostics, analysis, um, to support these activities, we established a corona research response fund, and we've been able to raise uh, already uh, about $6.5 million uh, to support these activities, numerous activities. In addition to these uh, research-oriented activities, we actually established at the Wiseman a national uh, uh, testing center for corona uh, uh, infected people. Uh, we invested quite a lot in that. And we also uh, established a lab with the sole purpose of making the diagnosis, the, <coughs> the tests uh, much faster. Actually, uh, um, usually uh, each line now in Israel is capable, say the, the common lines in the hospitals, are capable of uh, testing about 1,000 uh, people per day. Right now we have a pipeline, uh, which we uh, 
I think will be validated finally uh, this week, which is capable uh, of doing 20,000 uh, uh, tests per day. And we're actually screening now the Israeli army, uh, completely uh, free of charge. And so we did actually for uh, the uh, Israeli citizens. So these are all activities which we um, actually try to, to provide assistance as much as possible um, to the state of Israel. Uh, a fair number of our scientists also uh, advise in different committees and think tanks. I think including the, our speakers today, uh, two uh, different bodies in the uh, Israeli government. Uh, and actually the uh, exit strategy has been formulated by a team led, uh, led by uh, uh, Professor Eli Waxman from the, uh, from the Faculty of Physics at the Institute. So uh, we do whatever we can to help uh, fighting this uh, pandemic, but on the same time, we keep on uh, our normal or routine research activities uh, because we have to think on the day after as well. Okay? There are many different other things that needed to be addressed and there are other diseases and other illness that we should uh, be attentive to. So we try to keep a balance between the urgent needs, the immediate needs, and our long uh, standing goals, uh, including, for example, uh, the Ultrasat project, which I remind you is a scientific satellite, which we would like to launch in uh, 2024. And I'm pleased to inform you that we uh, have an agreement with NASA uh, to launch the satellite in, in 2024. Uh, so we work on these aspects as well during this crisis. And I think it's important uh, to maintain uh, life um, because there will be a day after the corona. We'll, we'll, we'll go through it and we should think ahead. And this is what we're trying to do. So I'm not going to take much of your time, uh, more time. I just uh, will go ahead and uh, introduce the two speakers. Uh, Professor Uri Alon and Professor Ron Milo. Uh, from now on, I'll be referring to them as Uri and Ron. And they have actually uh, many things in common. So both of them served in the same uh, uh, program in the Israeli Defense Forces called Talpiot. And this is a program where uh, the army identifies uh, kids with an IQ which is much, much, much too high for their own good. And then uh, uh, send them to the university, uh, usually to study mathematics and physics. And after they finish, um, they uh, get back to the army and they're being placed in different places um, to do miracles, uh, technological, and they do, okay? Uh, so the, this is the common practice. They make miracles wherever they are positioned. Both Uri and uh, Ron studied and did mathematics and physics at the Hebrew University. And both of them after uh, or during their uh, graduate studies, uh, gradually or not gradually shifted to biological systems while returning or re retaining uh, a very rigorous uh, mathematical and physical thinking. Both of them are leaders in their respective fields, world leaders. Uri Alon is actually one of the founders uh, of the field, which is called systems biology. And finally, they are connected by the mere fact that uh, Ron was a PhD student of Uri. So uh, I uh, again would like to thank you all for joining us for this uh, conference, which I'm sure will be uh, exciting. And uh, would like to thank you again for your continued support uh, during these challenging times. 
and wish you health and peace. Okay, I guess the, so hello everybody. For several times, I thought to myself, you know, enjoying the hospitality that I got of friends of Weizmann around the world, that I should invite people also to my house in Israel in Kfar Saba. I didn't guess that this would give me an opportunity to, to do that through the corona, but you're all most welcome to our small dwelling uh, out here. And so what I'll be telling you about uh, it's sort of like a, uh, as a prelude to the exit strategy is about a, how this coronavirus uh, is related to things that we've been thinking about throughout the years. So I'll share with you a short presentation that would lead us into the main event about the work together with Uri about exit strategies. Maybe you just do like that so I see that you hear me and the things are fine more or less. Okay. And just one second. Okay, so I assume you see the presentation. If not, let me know. And if there are any questions also feel free to write them. I'll try to uh, get back to you throughout. Okay, so really for the past 15 years, I was on, on a quest, if you like, or trying to bring quantitative aspects into biology and doing biology by the numbers. And this uh, resulted in a book, a database, all sorts of really interesting interactions. But then the coronavirus appeared and it was clear to me that we could try and use numbers also versus the coronavirus. In a way, the idea is to use numbers as our sixth sense in defeating the virus. Uh, so that's the, that's the logic behind the effort. And so we started assembling numbers related to the virus and to the disease and to the outbreak. You probably saw lots of numbers uh, uh, in the newspapers, but we're talking kind of different things, not just about how many casualties there are, but about other things that enable us to answer. For example, the following questions are such examples of the thing that we've been looking at, like how long does it take to reach a million infected from one infected person? What is the effect quantitatively of social distancing? Why is the quarantine period two weeks? How do masks work? How is the uh, virus related to the common cold, to the flu virus? Uh, what can we learn from the genome of the virus? What can we learn about the mutation rates and the ability to develop vaccines that would be effective? And things about stability of virions on surfaces. And we think those like using numbers to analyze those questions could give us this uh, capability, but it's really not just the numbers, it's really also together with a pretty amazing group of people that joined in into the effort. On each one, if I had more time, I could tell you a lot, but just if you see at the top left, Avi Flamholz uh, seen here. Uh, so actually I got to meet him thanks to the friends of, of Weizmann when I was invited to give a talk in New York. And actually his grandmother was, uh, was a supporter of Weizmann. She told him, hey, I have a ticket for this event. I think it was the Museum of Asian Arts or something like that. And then at the time he was uh, just finished uh, working in Google uh, after be doing in Princeton and you know, was actually excited by what uh, he heard and decided to come to Weizmann for a few years to, to work together. And like that, I could tell you a story about Benoit at the bottom that came from Paris, about Vanessa that came from Germany and how they all connected together, but I'll move to the corona itself. What you can see here is kind of like this snapshot of this collection of numbers that we were after. I won't get into the details, obviously, but I just want you to see the logic of like collecting the numbers, which shows us the properties of that virus. For example, you can see the bat coronaviruses versus the pangolin coronaviruses and how the genome look like things about the replication rate, the sizes, the components, the evolution rate, the mutation rate, all of those things. And that's just the beginning. We have more and more of that on how many cells of host are being affected, what's the stability on surfaces and things like that. But out of all that, there's one particular thing that I'll, uh, that's interesting. If you look at what I zoomed in, it's about the progression of the virus. And as you'll see, that would connect very soon to what Uri is proposing as our element 
or important component into the exit strategy. And in that way, the numbers connect with uh, what we need to do in order to be able to uh, deal with the disease and manage it better. What we did appeared in, in, uh, in English as a, as a you know, peer reviewed paper and immediately got hundreds of thousands of people sharing it. And then students in the international community at Weizmann on campus said, hey, we wanna bring this knowledge also to our home countries. And they started uh, translating it to different languages. And what you can see here is a list of about, I think, 20 languages in which it's already available and is circulated around. Anybody wants to guess what's the language that we see at the bottom left? So this is, uh, this is the version in Thai. If anybody, I know I can't hear you, but if you got it right, well done for you. And this is part of like, so all of this is really the way to get the numbers so that uh, scientists throughout the world and decision makers could make better decisions how to deal with that. And that takes us directly into what Uri will tell you in a minute, but just to make the connection very clear, maybe you can try and recognize also people in this picture so this is, was just when I was finishing my PhD and heading to Harvard Medical School to do my uh, postdoc research. And that's how we said goodbye. And I would never have guessed that we'll come back together, work at Weizmann and then work on the kind of project I will be, you'll be hearing soon. I sometimes feel like it's kind of like the Blues Brothers that will be united in order to do one final big project. Uri, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi everyone, it's very nice to see you and meet you and uh, one th that was a nice picture, sent me back uh, some years uh, and it's really amazing to be able to work together again. Um, and, and the kind of numbers that Ron has been assembling help us to identify a vulnerability of the virus that we could exploit to make a, an, an exit strategy from, a, from this dilemma that we have now in the world. The dilemma is that um, we have lockdown in many countries or social distancing to bring the number of cases down, but the lockdown it has a, it's like an economic uh, cr economic uh, epidemic, you can see. And lots of businesses are be becoming bankrupt and 30% un unemployment is clearly untenable. A lot of uh, emotional and, and uh, medical stress, people don't take care of their medical problems and we're gonna see a lot of problems with lockdown, violence at home, stock markets crashing. So it's clear we have to lift the lockdown and start working again. And, but the problem is that if you do that, the virus uh, epidemic can start rising again. That's a great fear that sometime in the winter we'll have another resurgence. It's an unpredictable. And so we're entering an unpredictable time. And of course we know that economy needs confidence and predictability in order to thrive. And then it's thought that if there's another uh, resurgence, we'll need to have another lockdown. So you give people hope and then you take it away which is a, a, a kind of a grim outlook. And then maybe another, and maybe we're looking for it a couple of years of up, down like that. That's the fear. I mean, I hope that exiting lockdown will make the virus go away, but it's possible that we'll have a resurgence. And that's where we kind of got into thinking, could we have an exit strategy that takes into account both suppressing the disease, as is again, preventing a resurgence, and at the same time, offering economic activity, not as wide as, you might hope, but still something predictable, sustainable, that will give people employment and give confidence to the economy. And our suggestion, I just wanna say our suggestion is, it should be thought of as one component in a big exit plan where you do everything that we know, social distancing, masks, testing, everything continues and, and uh, during work, you work under special corona stipulations, but you add to that a cycle, which we call intermittent work, where you work four days, let's say Monday to Thursday, and then you have 10 lockdown days, and then that's a two-week cycle, and then you have four work days, 10 lockdown days, etc. And you can see that four work days give you 40% of, uh, of the 10 work days you usually have, or a third if you're also working on uh, 
one day in the weekend, etc. So you can have employment for millions of non-essential workers. You can give a part-time employment, and we can discuss which sectors this works for better or or worse. And and the beautiful thing about it is that here's the lockdown. Cases go down. If you do this work, lockdown, work, lockdown, work, lockdown, it promises you to have a replication number less than one. That is to say, that's the critical thing in epidemiology, right? We want each infected person to infect not more than one other person. If you infect two people, they infect two people, four, eight, 16, that's the exponential rise. The replication number greater than one, you have the problem. If replication number is less than one, you just need to push it less than one. Each person infects, let's say a half, quarter, one eighth, and the disease goes away. This uh, four, 10 cycle uh, gives you on average a decline. And so you're basically protected from resurgence. If you, even if you have some cases coming in from abroad or anything like that, they can't spread very widely. And you are protected from resurgence and you enter a kind of routine that has partial work and partial lockdown. And the reason we choose four days is because we're exploiting a virus time scale against itself. So the idea is that, you know, just like Ron said, once you get infected, there's three days where you're not infecting other people. It's called the latent period. The virus is still building up inside you and it's not going out. And after that, you become infectious for about a week. So in this scheme, if you get infected on a work day, you reach your peak infectiousness in the lockdown days where you're not exposed to many other people. And that really cuts down the virus's ability to infect many others. Of course, you might infect some people at home and they might go into work. But we're, since we're talking here about getting the replication number less than one, what we need is the average effect. And we are using the latent period, putting it on the work and the infectious period on the lockdown to restrict the virus's ability to infect many people. And that's a new concept in epidemiology that we think we can exploit here uh, with this virus. It becomes even better if you think about dividing the population into two groups of households. So you have group A of households, let's say by family name or something like that, and group B of households. And now each one works four and 10, but each group, if group A works on one week, group B works on the next week. So each the group's work weeks are staggered. So each time you have a different group working and also schools, you have schools opening and the kids from that household go to school on one week and kids from the other group go to school on the other week. And the benefit of that is that on top of all the other benefits, you also reduce the density. So if you have two, two kids at a desk, now you can have one kid at a desk and you have less chance of infection. Of course, you have to take care of the recess and everything like that. And also at work and in malls, et cetera, you have half density and the economy is now working almost continuously because you have one shift working week, group A, one shift working the next week group B. This strategy can be used in a whole country or just a region or a city or a county or a company because if a company or a region does it, it has replication number less than one, it's protected from infections that are imported from the outside. They can't spread very much. So you can try this on a small scale or apply it to um, a school, a district, a country, etc. And the, it's important still to know that on those work days where everybody works and goes to school, it's not a, a huge party where everybody gets infected. It has to be Corona style work days where you take many, many measures in order to make sure there's uh, social distancing. The idea is to get the economy restarted, um, but still uh, protect against uh, resurgences. The, um, uh, this is of course, uh, has, the way we got to this is in collaboration with epidemiologists and economists. So we're using here kind of tested, tried and true uh, epidemi epidemiological models. And you can vary many parameters and this still is predicted to work. The stronger you make the lockdown and the more stringent you are in your work days, the more chance you have uh, to control the epidemic. Uh, and in the long time, you save lives because just because this is the number of, uh, let's say, cases or deaths if you do this strategy. If you don't do it, there'll be a resurgence and another resurgence. And each resurgence like this costs more lives. And so it's a way to both protect against resurgence and have a, an economic activity. So some sectors like uh, agriculture, high tech, uh, 
people who can work remotely or in open spaces, it's perfect for them. Case, things like uh, restaurants, hotels, which are very people intense, will have to open up with a lot of restrictions. But on those four days of work, everybody will go to your shop, everybody will go to your coffee shop with these restrictions. And so you can imagine a kind of routine. This routine is predictable. You know exactly when people will be in your shop, when people will be in your company. So investors and managers can have a bit of confidence in the plan. And sometimes they think of this as a, a good plan where if our current exit from lockdown doesn't work and we have a resurgence, we'll need a really creative solution. And this could be it for an intermediate period of six months up to a year and a half until the time when we have a vaccine or such good testing like in South Korea where we can um, avoid lockdown altogether. And so this uh, plan has been presented uh, quite widely in Israel and appeared in uh, the Gertner Institute, which is an epidemiological institute advising the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education as a recommended plan for reopening schools in this staggered way. And we're also uh, very interested in reaching um, decision makers in, in other countries, uh, even countries who don't have, you know, countries who don't have the testing capacity. You know, don't, this covers much, many, much of the world's population can still do this 410 strategy because all you need to do is enforce a lockdown, right? You have work and lockdown. So this could be uh, possible for a wide range of situations. And, uh, we have a material that we'll, if you're interested, to share going from Financial Times, uh, talking about this as a feasible policy, to scientific preprints, to computer codes, or write-ups for, for policy advisors that we are uh, developing. So I'm actually very curious uh, at this point to, to hear your comments and, your, and to learn from you. I'm going to try to... Um, reach my chat here. Uh, Ron, I also, Uri, yeah. I, I also got a few questions, so perhaps I can uh, ask some of those um, uh, while other people send in their questions. So uh, first of all, thank you, and I'm sure we'll have lots of opportunity to thank you. This is very exciting and offers that glimmer of hope that we all need. So uh, one of the questions I received was, the epicenters are in senior residences. Would it be better to use this for tailoring work schedules of doctors, nurses, and the staff going into these residencies, yes. residences and end the lockdown in the rest of the economy? So the question is about senior residences, which are hotspots of infection and unfortunately of, of critical cases and death. And you're thinking here of the medical teams and the support teams going in. So that would be a perfect case. You have a group you don't want to put all the eggs in one basket. So you do want to have them in shifts. So if one shift gets infected, you can quarantine them without leaking into the other shift. So the staggered 410 strategy for the medical team and support team would be perfect here. It would protect them and also offer the chance to have two shifts so that you don't lose everything if somebody gets infected for a 14 day quarantine. Did I answer the question? Yes. So thank you for and that. I think I think you have a number of other questions in the chat box right now, and I've received some by email, which I'll ask Susan, you. Susan, why don't you read one of them and, and we can go like that. If that's okay, fine. sure. So, uh, okay. Um, recent cases of COVID appearing in animals. Uh, thoughts or insights on COVID transferring between humans and animals? Yeah, so uh, animals like pets, I suppose, there is insight like that. So that's, I think, why it's so critical to do this staggered situation in households. So you think of the entire household, the parents, the pets, the kids, and they're um, going to be, if you do two staggered groups of the population, they're not going to be able to infect the other group. So that really cuts down on that uh, issue. But I don't have much information about transmission from pets and animals uh, per se. Thank you. Um, another question. How many cycles do you think it would take of this model before we can resume? How um, many cycles would it take? So I, on the bright side, maybe pie in the sky, if the whole world does this on the same four days, right? The whole economy is doing this. In principle, it should give us replication number less than one for the world. 
And that's a new kind of solution. It should mean that over time you have less and less cases. And it, just like SARS vanished in the end, Ebola, there's a possibility that this virus will also vanish without needing herd immunity or vaccines. So that, there's a potential like that if the whole world does it. If part of the world does it, unfortunately, we'll see some countries reach herd immunity, which is a tragedy where everybody, so many people get infected that the virus kind of dies away in that country after a lot of uh, problems. And then the country you do do 410 can go through this period and potentially will, uh, that's one way to think about uh, losing this virus without a vaccine. Of course, uh, it could be hidden reservoirs of the virus or mutations we don't know about. So far, it doesn't look that way. That maybe will surprise us, but uh, on the face of it, that's one possibility. So with, with each cycle, for example, you might lose you know, 20% of the virus, 20, 20, 20. It's like 20% interest. And within a few cycles like that, you know, a few months, you go, you're down to very low levels in principle. Mm. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. Um, here's another question. Given that assumptions is such a large part of the economy, I was curious if this work lockdown would apply to consumption, albeit in controlled group sizes. That is, can we mimic this structure for allowing people to go to restaurants, theaters, malls? So then if I, I'm not sure I understood the question. I, the way I understand it is, can we find a way to run restaurants, theaters, malls, but make adjustments in order to reduce the transmission? Did I understand the question? Exactly. So I think that here uh, we already see how human creativity manages to find creative solutions for businesses within the constraints imposed by the governments right now. So for instance, I went to a shop uh, today and the shop had this list, you know, we're not allowed more, allowing more than four people at one time. You have to stand two meters. So I believe that uh, even things like hotels, restaurants, tourism, uh, sports events, we'll be able to find ways to reduce transmission and still have some of the essence of the event. But that requires specific um, case-by-case case analysis. And our plan just rides on that kind of analysis and adds to it this temporal component, this staggered intermittent work. So everything you think about exit strategies, which is good, do it and add to it the intermittent work idea. And they will combine synergistically with the more is, the sum is more than, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. You know? So assuming uh, in addition to uh, this great family of Weitzman supporters, you also had policymakers in this room and you could get a blank canvas. How, what would you do tomorrow? Um, yeah, I would counsel yeah. tomorrow. If your country or is in a case where, where cases are starting to, just starting to reduce, yeah? Just like in, in many countries. Right. Uh, not, maybe the US not yet, but in many other countries, I would say this, take a county or a region and try this for a month. And pre pre present it to companies and schools and see which schools buy onto this. And then within that community, monitor what happens. And if you see that it's working, that is the cases are declining there, you can expand it and uh, you can see, actually, the, the, the risk is not very large because the worst thing that can happen is that cases don't, they won't want to shoot up like this. It's going to go up and then you can reduce a work day, go from four to three. Or if it's working really well, you can add a work day, go from four to five. So it's adaptive and tunable. So that's what I would counsel. Make a, a trial with limited time and a limited population and convince yourself that it's actually working and you can also see maybe the benefit to education, school, work. So the parents, the kids will go to school, the parents will go to work in that region and, and see how, how it's going. Did I answer the question? Yes. You're terrific, Uri. You always answer the question. You think of the answer before the question's asked. Here's another one. Your proposal is obviously multidisciplinary. Have you also included formal analysis using control theory? I just read an article about a similar approach published. Okay. Yeah. So this question has to do with uh, control theory. Control theory is in engineering. Suppose you want to make a, you know, the satellite that Weizmann is going to send 
you want to make it sure it's in a particular orbit. So you control the rockets. So if it goes off the orbit, it corrects all the time. That's control theory. Control theory is a beautiful a mathematical tool. And indeed we used it, the, the elements of it, where our problem here is not to get the satellite into orbit, but to get coronavirus down with replication number below one. And this strategy in control theory is something that's called bang, bang, which means either do your maximum lockdown or your maximum work. It's like, sometimes you fire your rocket like that in the satellite. And so intellectually it builds on these ideas from engineering, combining them with epidemiology and economy economics, all these disciplines together in order to try to make a balanced exit strategy that takes into account both the, the epidemic and the economy. I hope I was clear. Yes, I always learn something new. Um, another question. In the UK, uh, the Office for Budget Responsibility estimates that the full lockdown costs about 35% of weekly GDP. Can you calculate the implied loss during your adjustment period? So the question is, can you calculate economically, what will this do to the GDP, to employment, et cetera? And in fact, we can. So we're working with Iran Yashiv, who's a macroeconomist from Tel Aviv University and also advising the Royal Bank in England and Royal Society. And he's a macroeconomist economist who specializes in the labor market. And he built economic models that combine the, the disease course with what we know from previous horrible periods like Great Depression and Great Recession to try to understand what will happen. And he sees large gains in GDP and reduction in unemployment and reduction in something extremely important, which is if you let people be unemployed for a long time, they lose their skills. Some of them will never go back to work. And that makes recovery very, very difficult. That happened in the Great Recession. By the way, Canada was better than by uh, helping people get back to work in a subsidized way as compared to other countries. And that helped them get out of the great recession quicker because of keeping the workforce. So all these effects together, we see that this intermittent work strategy has very large economic gains because you, you take these millions of unemployed and you give them part-time employment, you can extend work hours, work in shift, job sharing, the informal economy, people who are cash economy, they have this breathing space so they can actually adhere to the 10 day lockdown and not yeah. cheat because they have no choice. Because, And so a lot of sectors uh, get uh, so much oxygen, quote unquote, you can calculate the gains are, are tremendous. Thank you. We have uh, 25 new questions, so I'm going to try and get through them. Thank you. Um, That's how do you... <laughs> well, your theory is exciting. How do you determine who is on lockdown in the community? Can you repeat, please? Sure. How would you determine who should be on lockdown in a community? OK, so you have a community. How do you determine who should be on lockdown? There's a lot of work right now on that question. It could vary by community to community. In our view, um, one uh, group that's important to think about is people risk group, immunocompromised people. I don't think it should go by age, by the way. I think it should go by health status, because you can have a 70-year-old that's healthy like a 50-year-old no reason to be kept indoors necessarily. But all these things are being dealt with already, right? Which sectors to, to go out, low risk sector. Here we're adding this 410 strategy. It could be that after a few cycles, infections have gone down so much, you want to let everybody out for everybody's mental health and physical health on those four days. So you can visit your family. So you can do all those things that are so essential for society. and. Uh, that by that time, the, the number of cases is so low that the risk isn't that great. By that time, the number of cases is so low that when you have an infection, you can go to good old shoe leather epidemiology and find out the contacts and isolate them. So we can have the power of what we should have done you know, a long time ago. So there's a, there's a chance where this question will be only relevant for the first few weeks. And after that, you let out everyone. Did I answer the question? Yes. Um... So uh, another business leader uh, commented on your earlier response about the GDP. Uh, that would mean uh, economic growth would fall and flatten to a much lower level with a shrinkish, shrinkage in valuations and could lead to a very severe financial crisis. Yeah, you know, that's the, the point is that we can have a, a, a reduced growth and severe and long lasting financial crisis. 
And I'm afraid that any, that we're kind of stuck with, between the double and the deep blue sea. So our other option is now to open up. The growth will happen, but then there's a resurgence and we need another lockdown in an unpredictable moment. And businesses now don't have the capital anymore because they've already been through a lockdown. And we would, we're fa that has the potential for a longer, longer kind of depression and longer damage to the economy. And also think about the confidence in the economy. If there's a looming resurgence, what is your confidence in the economy, the animal spirits that are necessary for, uh, for faith in the economy, as opposed to a predictable schedule where you know when everybody's going to work and exactly what's going to happen. And you can adjust to make uh, investments in that, in that scenario. So I, I think your input yeah. is extremely valuable here because you have so much more experience, but that's what we get from the economists, this essential value of predictability and of uh, confidence. Uh, another question, uh, and Ron, feel free to jump in. Uh, I'm looking at you too. Um, would you say that the staggered groups would need to get tested regularly to make sure the group is negative? How feasible would that be to get as many people tested, for example, in the United States? Yeah. So before I answer, uh, Susan, if you could open up my uh, Ron's mic, you could uh, also... Uh, I wish I could, but Heidi's in charge. Oh, Heidi, Heidi said yes. <laughs> so the question is about how does testing fit into this? So as I said before, testing should be developed and continue. Regardless of this, this is another component. But if you have this 410 lockdown, you can use testing in a smarter way. For example, if you have a certain amount of tests, if you test the people, just before they exit lockdown and as they're entering work, you can catch the cases that are most relevant. And that can help you make a more optimal use of your tests. So testing is of course, the more the better and contact isolation. But this 410 strategy adds another layer of when and who to test that could be very interesting. You can test the group that's about to exit lockdown. And next we can test the other group that's about to enter lockdown. And since they've only seen their household members, it's very easy now to isolate or to test the entire household. And therefore your use of tests could be more effective. I hope I was clear. Yes, always. Uh, we have a number of questions from people who are dying to get on an aircraft, plus a bunch of executives from Air Canada on the, on the screen here. So can you comment about travel? Oh, travel. Yeah, that's a, uh, of course, uh, in our, um, in our uh, strategy, we imagine that after uh, you know, the first few cycles, as I said, you open up the entire economy on those work days. And if we do a staggered, you have half the number of people in principle on each flight. And you do this for a month, two months, and you see what's going on. You, by then your testing is very good. And you see how much the travel sector is contributing to new cases. As I said, because you're keeping R below one, or if you got it wrong, a little bit above one, we're not going to see a huge catastrophe. We'll see a slow increase. And then we'll be able to modulate each sector. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, yes, uh, makes sense. And I have uh, a number of questions. Maybe we'll take two more questions. Susan, um, Susan, if, could, Susan, Ron, if I can Ron just, I see there's quite a few questions about really the issue of behavior and so, and so I want to point out that one of the reasons for this proposal comes from the fact of like the importance to take into account not only epidemiological aspects, but really psychological aspects as well as the economy and the effects on behavior and well-being and the psyche of people. So this, this is one reason why to go on such a thing that enables this intermittent work already in the beginning. Yeah. And as pointed out, there was discussion of like, how would people react to that? Whether like in different countries, whether they would comply with the suggestion. And I agree there's all sorts of heterogeneity and, we, and it's hard to know uh, uh, in advance. That's why it's good to start in different counties and to try it out. At the same time, I would say, and this was also the response they were mentioning uh, Daniel Kahneman. So Daniel Kahneman in discussing such things as our proposal said that, you know, if you just go out of lockdown and then there will be a resurgence and things will 
close down, need, there will be a need for another lockdown, that would be very problem, problematic. Because what we know from the social sciences is that people respond very badly to when they're given something back and then it's being taken again and not knowing whether it will be taken, how often and what's, what's the future. What this proposal suggests is to have know-how and knowledge what's going to happen in the, in the medium future, in the near future. So you know from the beginning that you're giving an ability to go back to intermittent work and then you need to go to some lockdown and say after a month of that, we could evaluate the situation. And if we see things are well, we could give more capability of work. So there's knowledge from the beginning of where we're heading. And that's very important in order to have the people comply with that. And still, I would imagine it would be different in Israel versus the US versus Austria in terms of how people comply and behave. And I guess we have no, um, we'll have to uh, very carefully do try to move in that direction. Yes, tough to navigate. Um, uh, can we take uh, two more questions? And then if, uh, if we don't get to everyone's questions, uh, I promise if you send them to me by email, um, I will make sure we get answers. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so many great questions. Um, is there a way to test the suggested method um, that would be tested in uh, parallel in small communities? Is there, you know, how, how do we take it from this amazing presentation to the next step? So is there a way to test it? Yeah, there is definitely a way to test it. You can take, it's actually going to start here in Israel with a company called Applied Materials. It's a company that builds machines to look at, uh, microchips and make sure that they're well designed. And they've uh, uh, agreed or actually took, they got excited about this and it said, this is perfect for us. We're going to shift, work in two shifts and do 410 schedule. And then just within a company like that, that has about a thousand people, after a few weeks, you'll be able to see the trends in the, in the infections. And uh, that's, a, that's just a simple case. You have a company that anyway wants to make a shift structure because they don't want to lose their entire workforce. It's critical for them. And this say, is an immediate decision just of their you know, chief of operations and their CEO. So that's, that's easy. On a, on a national level, I guess a, a small town or a county, a county, a school, it could be different levels, can buy into this and the incentive, of course, is the uh, is an alternative to lockdown. I would say, in, in a situation where you have a lockdown in a state, an alternative to lockdown. So that's a big economic incentive to start working. And I can imagine that, you know, adherence people people that don't adhere to lockdown, they have, usually have a reason. They don't have food. They don't have money. They don't. They can't bear it. If you if you have four days where you can do everything you need, it'll be easier to adhere to the lockdown days after that. And so you, you might be able to see a psychological bonus. Somebody mentioned Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman said that, well, I think Ron mentioned it, that exiting lockdown and having a resurgence could be a, such a psychologically frustrating event that a, a more predictive schedule, even if it's grim, could be something people can you know, get into at least enough for it to make this work. And of course, not everyone will comply. Absolutely. So, um, Ron, Uri, some final comments before I wrap up? Yeah, so, so I just want, I, I wanted to say that I, I see people in, in the personal chat are asking me for the slides or more information. And I want to be very clear. We would love to have everybody get both the slides and we could give all, there's links there. Everything we make completely transparent. And the whole idea is to have this, you know, go to the relevant policymakers or scientific circles, but also other circles where this could be used. And I, I think I'm also speaking by the name of Uri, that like uh, one reason for us to do this with this uh, great uh, uh, friends of Weizmann is because we know some people here might be relevant in the decision-making process and will be happy to give any further information as needed. And, so, and uh, so you if you think there are issues that we can uh, work on and, and sharpen in your particular situation that's very precious for us because 
it helps us to, to make a more complete uh, understanding of the exit strategy. So perhaps uh, since everyone who's participating uh, will receive a thank you email from us, perhaps we can mention in there if you'd like uh, that way uh, it can come uh, from us and, and we want you focused on your science and we'll take care of the, making sure thank everybody you. gets the information. Um, Uri, did you have any final comments before I just wrap up? Maybe just to thank everyone for taking this time and for the questions and um, and for and for being together. I think this this is all the secret. <laughs> yes, it's nice to be together. Thank you all for making time to be with us for this fascinating presentation. Uh, it really does offer us a glimmer of hope. If you, haven't if you haven't already done so, we hope you'll consider supporting the Global Emergency Response Fund. Your support will empower our scientists and continue to move things forward, and together we can solve this crisis. Votre support est incontournable. More information can be found on our website, the website of your respective countries. You can also reach out to any of us directly. We'd be so happy to hear from you. Thank you, merci, todaraba, gracias. I also want to thank Ron, Uri, and Ziv. Listening to you really fills us with hope and a lot of great information, which is empowering. I also want to thank my team at Weizmann Canada, as well as the team at the Weizmann Institute, headed by Kelly Avidan, for their efforts in putting this event together. Most importantly, we're sending warm wishes for good health to all of you and your loved ones. And I look forward to being together soon on the beautiful campus of the Weizmann Institute. Thank you and be well.